Hi, this is John Atak, and um, Chris Shelton and I have got together yet again. I think this is the 26th time. I'm not really counting, though. <laughs> so, great. Yeah. Okay, here we are. So, um, yes, welcome to the show, everybody. Uh, John and I are doing another podcast. And this week, we are going to talk about Scientology auditing. And this is Dianetics and Scientology auditing. There, there really isn't a whole lot of difference there. And we're going to talk about, I, I have recently been asked very point blank, um, hey, look, you guys bitch and moan and talk about and criticize Scientology up one side and down the other, and you talk about this and you talk about that, but you know what you don't talk about is the auditing. You know, the, it seems to me that the auditing really works. Seems to me the auditing produces results. Seems to me the auditing gets wins. Look at all these testimonials. Look at all these Scientologists talking about this stuff. So why is it, and we're going to try to answer this question in this podcast today, why is it that Scientology auditing is bad for you? And that's a very simple question with a lot of answer to it. Mm -hmm. And so I reached out to John and I said, hey, let's talk about this. And John said, yeah, absolutely, let's do it. So um, this is what we are doing today. And um, John, of course, has written extensively. And of course, I have produced video work and written about the, 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 the bad elements of Scientology auditing. But, I'm, but I, today, I think we're going to try to just focus on that one thing and kind of throw everything into the mix as to what is going on in an auditing session and why is it bad for you? And that's mm -hmm. basically the umbrella idea here of today's talk. So um I always lead with, by the way, John, one of the things I always try to lead with when I, when I direct people in this direction is, is one of your papers is uh, Never Believe a Hypnotist, which you, where you compiled a whole bunch of quotes from Hubbard himself about the subject of hypnotism. Mm -hmm. And what was, what was, what's up with that paper? Well, it clearly shows that Hubbard knew exactly what he was doing and that, that he knew that what he was doing was hypnosis. I mean, I... It, it was just a, it, it was back in the early 90s, and it struck me that as the bridge publications had produced these books with these wonderful indices, so you could you could check words like suggestion and <laughs> hypnosis. So I went through the research and discovery volumes, Dianetics, uh, Science of Survival, the early books, and just typed up every, every reference I found, and then I printed it all out, cut it into little strips of paper, and put them into groups. And I think I ended up with 14 groups of material. And I, it, it was a turning point for me. I mean, I'd been out for eight years or so. I stopped believing within a few months of leaving. And seeing just how cold-blooded it was, yeah. that the understanding that, that Hubbard had, um, and a friend of mine, uh, Jos Urgard, who, who was um, uh, a professor at Urs University and the founder of the Dialogue Centre International in, in Denmark, and a, a really brilliant human being, um, he went on the, the tour at St. Hill. And uh, when he got to Ron's office, he started writing down the titles of the books on the shelves. And uh, the next time he went, all the books had been taken off the shelves. Now, those books were fundamentally cheap novels, science fiction, um, magic books. He was quite interested to see that there were magic books on the shelves. Yeah. Um, and a lot of books about hypnotism. And Hubbard himself recommended 25 Lessons in Hypnosis. There were two books called that. It's not clear which one. Arnie Lerma thought it was one. I thought it was the other. And Hypnotism Comes of Age by Wolf and Rosenthal. He recommends them in lectures. That's right. I remember that title from the LRH mm. mentioned books list. That's right. Mm. Well, I got these books and read them because it seemed that, that, you know, if Ron was recommending the books, you know, I ought to, if, you know, and he does actually say that every auditor needs to understand hypnosis. But he only said it once and he said it quietly in a lecture that nobody listens to. Right. But every order. Auditor needs to. So, yeah, 
for somebody who's deeply interested in this, and let's hope everybody watching is deeply interested in this, uh, you can find the, the paper, Never Believe a Hypnotist, uh, which is a quote from Ron Hubbard, by the way, who said that he started practicing hypnosis at the age of 16. And um, when I contacted Don Rogers, who was one of, there were three people with Hubbard when he wrote Dianetics, uh, Dr. Joe Winter, Sarah, uh, his second and bigamous wife, uh, Sarah Hollister, Sarah Northrup, um, and Don Rogers. Don Rogers' appendix was in Dianetics and Modern Science and Mental Health right into the 80s, the mind schematic. So a piece he wrote was in Dianetics, with his name on it even. And um, Jerry Armstrong put me in touch with him back in 84. And there's this guy saying, oh, yeah, when he got the commission to write the book, he came to me and he said, well, we can't use deep transhypnosis anymore. So all of the early work was done using deep transhypnosis. I have absolutely no doubt about that. And if you go and look at the paper, you'll see Hubbard himself pretty much confessing that. Mm -hmm. um, and by, and let's clarify by early work, we're talking about the quote unquote research period of 1948, 1949, that time period? Yeah, everything until Art Sepos, uh, Hermitage House, which is a medical publisher, yep. commissions Dianetics okay. um, on Science and Mental Health, which, which is round about January of 1950. Yep. And Hubbard basically says, we'll have to use a different method. And he, th there was no doubt that he knew that the word reverie, which he uses in the book, indicates what what. Hypnotists at the time called light trance. Yeah. Um, it's very much the method used by the great Milton Erickson. Um, I personally think that, that you can't counsel people without understanding altered states and hypnosis mm -hmm. and, and how you come into con command of a person by being in a, an authority position, which Hubbard also talked about. Um, so, but af after issuing. Um, modern sign of mental health, Hubbard decided that the technique was dangerous and he cancelled it. In 1951, in the book Science of Survival, there's a specific statement. Um, a pre-clear after he closes his eyes will begin to flutter his eyelids. Mm -hmm. This is a symptom of the very lightest level of hypnotic trance. A simple test is to watch the person's eyeballs. You will find as he lies there that the eyeballs under the closed eyelids will hunt back and forth. You can see the bump of them on the eyelids and they will be wandering. The hunting indicates a hypnotic state. So that's Ron Hubbard saying that dianetic reverie is a hypnotic state. In 1977, the technique was reintroduced, book one auditing, and it stayed with us. So here you have this conflict that. He is saying it's hypnotic state, yeah. and there are serious problems with that idea. Um, when I trace the technique back, the first use of Dianetics, what he called Dianetics, was actually by Josef Breuer. Mm. Breuer funded Freud. He was one of two people who kept giving him money because he couldn't earn a living, and he provided him with the first case, Anna von O. And... Anna Fono ended up in an asylum. She was signed in by Josef Breuer, who had used the Dianetic technique on her. And she was signed in as a morphine addict. Um, and the person who prescribed her the morphine was Josef Breuer. So all of the stuff about how they got this breakthrough, that was what happened to their breakthrough case. She ended up in an asylum. She later studied analysis, became an analyst, and railed against Freud for a lifetime as a charlatan. Um, but Freud in, visited the US before the First World War, and it, Worcester, Massachusetts, gave a series of lectures. Those lectures, one of them contains the Dianetic Technique. Um, it's, the lecture's delivered when Hubbard's you know, about two years old or something, when Hubbard's very, so it wasn't his technique. Um, it, the word charge is used in the translation. The idea of going earlier similar is used. The idea of counting the person into a, a state where their memories will be accessible. Reverie, like trance. It's all there. 
But Freud condemns the technique, and I condemn Freud. It's well known. Anybody who knows me knows I hate Freud. But he was an absolute charlatan who yeah. did terrible damage. That's my my point of view. I, I, and his I view have of, to agree. I, and I will say yeah. I agree with this with this assessment. Yeah. Yeah, and it's certainly true that libido is one of the drives in a human being. But to say that libido or thanatos, the wish to kill yourself, are the two fundamental drives that operate on a cellular level, according to Freud, is abject nonsense. Yeah. But he did dismiss the Dianetic technique for a very simple reason. The whole purpose of Freudian analysis, and by the way, unlike Hubbard, Freud never tried his own techniques. He never had a single session of analysis himself. He didn't need it. He was above all of that. Um, a super narcissist. What can we say? Um, but the purpose of Freudian analysis is to resolve the transference. And the idea is that, that our early relationships with our caregivers determine how we will behave towards people later on. He believed in seduction theory. Uh, he put it aside because it was unpopular. There's a letter where he says that he, he still believes it, but it he doesn't, you know, it doesn't get punters through the door, basically. So he drops it. The idea of seduction theory is that all parents rape their children. Freud believed this. Freud, in fact, didn't speak to his own father for two years because he was convinced that he must have fiddled with him when he was a kiddie. Oh, my um, goodness. So super weirdo. But yeah, the idea is that the, what Freud you know, was you've got to, to, you've, you've may, got to it, grow up and learn how yeah. to communicate with people rather than, you know, being in rebellion against one of your parents and, and having a, an incestuous desire for your other parent, which is what he believed. And you, this is called transference. This is the idea that you have a relationship with somebody that's based upon a kind of infantile response. And in Freudian analysis, the analysand, the, the preclear, is meant to resolve the transference. Freud said the problem with Dianetics, the Breuer therapy, is that it creates more attachment to the therapist. It puts the therapist into a more dominant position. Mm -hmm. And I imagine that this is where Hubbard read about the technique, because he talks about Commander Thompson and having, you know, at the age of 12 in 1923, learned the mysteries of, of Freud right. um, in three days in a boat journey through the Panama Canal, which Russell Miller found the documentation for. Um, and there's, there's a peculiar idea, which Jeffrey Augustine tells me originated with him, that somehow um, Commander Thompson interfered with the 12-year-old Hubbard. Th this is... Again, it's utter speculation, mm -hmm. it, it, and it, you know, I, 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 I have, I don't think there's anything to support this idea. I think it's a dangerous idea. Mm -hmm. Freud, it, Hubbard was already a malevolent human being at the age of twelve. He didn't need anybody to mess with him, right. and he'd had a very, very supportive life as a kid. You know, right. on his exactly. uh, granddad's. Um, tiny little ranch, which he said was a quarter of Montana, of course. It, it, it wasn't, not quite. Right. So um, still, so we go. But the point is, as Nibs Hubbard so beautifully put it, Scientology works not as L. Ron Hubbard says it works, but as L. Ron Hubbard intends it to work. So that first part is to bind you to the process of auditing so you all want to, to have it. Yeah. What yeah. auditing does is it gets you high. That's you get it. very good indicators. Yep. You get high. What hypnosis does is it gets you high. Euphoria is the first effect. Yep. I was amazed when I saw I looked at the Emitri Essentials, is it, where you've got Mu Gum Gai Pam, which I'm told is some kind of Chinese food. Yep. Um, and I was looking to quote from it and spell that correctly. And I opened it up, and there are two pages of the colours in the room are brighter. I feel yeah. larger. I feel all things. These are pre-clear originations, yep. which are all known to any hypnotist. That distortions of perception, um, heightening of perception, these effects are are typical yep. for for hypnotic states. This is uh, so we're by seeing the way, what what we're referring to here. Just so people aren't thoroughly confused about this, because it's a little weird. 
is yeah. it's in Scientology. I mean, this is this is a little weird, but it's in Scientology. There is a there is a four page document called a preclear origination sheet. And it's just random statements that preclears will make in auditing sessions that are used as stock phrases when you're training auditors. You use these originations to throw off the student auditor and teach him how to deal with things a preclear might say in a session. Mm -hmm. And this includes lines like, the colors in the room are brighter, uh, my head feels like it has a tight band around it, um, you know, uh, I have an awful feeling of fear. Yeah, I have an awful feeling of fear. That's right. I can't uh, stop thinking about that cop who blew his whistle at me this that's, morning. That's right. You're remembering all the good ones. Yeah. I mean, we've been over and over and over these things because when you do training <laughs> in Scientology, you become very familiar with these lines. But John's making an incredibly good point, which is that most of these lines indicate an incredibly disassociated or altered state of reality. Mm -hmm. And let's talk about the essence of auditing, where auditing is meant to go, where auditing after Dianetics and the notion of clear was pushed aside. Mm -hmm. Hubbard started developing just one goal for Scientology, and that is exteriorization with full perception. Yes. The idea that you can get out of your head, get out of your mind. Let's, let's think about those expressions. And travel through the universe and be near Earth, be near Sun, be near, be wherever you want to be outside of your body. That's right. And I got, I was fascinated with this by the time I left because I hadn't met anybody who could do it. Mm -hmm. And I was an OT. I was, you know, I'd done 25 of the then 27 levels. And I was now talking to people who were, you know, had been pretending for however many years. I, mentioned before Stephanie Ryburn, who ran the uh, Birmingham Mission of Scientology. Um, when I first met her, she'd gone on a tour to find out why the American missions was making so much money and why they weren't making any, you know, why, why all their staff were claiming social security to, to be able to live. And she seemed to me a very dour person and i thought it was because she was reading my dirty mind and we all have dirty minds when we think people can read them. that's right <laughs> i was like 19 right. years old and 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 she always frowned at me she never smiled at me she never called me by name and so seven years later when i was on ot5 and she was on ot5 at saint hill she was a class eight auditor who had done her ot3 her you know xena and the wall of fire with hubbard on the ship. So she'd had the best person teaching her. And she came out beaming, very good indicators from a session, and said, isn't it fantastic? And she's smiling at me. She called me by my name. She said, isn't it fantastic that Ron's finally come up with something that clears up the mess that OT3 makes? So she'd been living for 14 or 15 years in this horrified state of pretense. And I, I had a friend who walked up to me after I'd done OT3 and he was on OT2 and he was like, so what are your fantastic wins? And it was like, well, actually, I went in and said, I don't think this does anything. You know, <laughs> maybe some people have got these body things, but it's not, you know, we are crossing over into fantasy land. So exteriorization with full perception. I ended up talking with Otto Rose about it. Otto, of course, had been Hubbard's auditor. He was one of only five people trained to class 12 by Hubbard personally. He was Hubbard's case supervisor. Um, he was thrown out in a moment because when Hubbard got had his winter sickness, he'd get bronchitis every winter, smoke 100 cigarettes a day. It, it's not body thetans, you know. And he got perilously sick yet again. And so Otto had gone through all of the paper he could find that was a record of Hubbard's auditing. He said, you know, there were bits of envelope and all sorts of things. And there was this thing about the rock slam on the e-meter, that this jagged response, which is actually because there's carbon dust coming off the Exactly. It's a it indicates a broken e-meter. Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I'd seen them doing it with no, no electrodes plugged in. Yep. So I knew there was a fault there. That's right. But Hubbard decided they used to... It used to determine the thing that was ruining your life, which was the rock, which is now gone from Scientology, long gone from Scientology. That's right. But so it was the rock slam. 
and then he decided it denoted evil purposes. And Otto simply pointed out to him that he'd found 200 of them in the folders. And he found himself standing on the dock with his passport and $5. And uh, that was the end of that. But yeah. Otto had, you know, he was big time into Scientology. He was, you know, he was still absolutely into it. He was, his staff and his many businesses were being given Scientology, but without being told what it was. Um, you know, he was very pleased when the ability meter came out because it didn't have the word Hubbard on it, an and e-meter without the word Hubbard on it. And so I talked with Otto about exteriorization, and he came up with a story that really fascinated me. Mm -hmm. Does Scientology work? Does it do what it claims to do? Does it produce people who can leave their bodies, travel around the universe, and cause wonderful effect, magical effects, just like a Disney movie, when you think about it, really, a rather bad Disney movie, probably. Is this possible? Well, there was one person who didn't think so, and that person was Mary Sue Hubbard. That's right. Formerly Mary Sue Whip, Aaron Hubbard's young wife, third wife. And she got in, you know, Otto said that there was this terrible argument one day on the ship where she was screaming at Hubbard and calling him a charlatan. And it wasn't the first time it had happened. And so Hubbard stormed out and said, Otto, find all of the exteriorization processes and run them on Mary Sue. And after a few weeks, she gave up and said, I just can't stand this anymore. Yep. So then I found out after leaving that there's this condition that psychiatry talks about called depersonalization. And this is the idea that you're outside of your body. Mm -hmm. When I talk with, you know, because you could, I could ask Scientologists about their experiences, and I did, hundreds of them probably. Mm -hmm. And the experiences were relatively pathetic. You know, I can change traffic lights. Yeah, really. They actually change on their own. Um, I can move clouds. Yeah. Can you move this little bit of tinfoil on the table here? Because the cloud's like two tons and it's hanging in the sky there. You can't move the tinfoil that's like two foot away from you. <laughs> you know, yeah, come on, guys. When I talked to people, they again and again and again, including Otto Rose, told me they had that feeling that they were outside their body, mm. which is a psychiatric symptom. Mm -hmm. Then you have derealization. That's the one where the world around you seems to melt, the one you get when you do TR zero or mindfulness meditation yes. or Zazen or what have you. Right. Your brain tries to, gives you feedback because there's nothing coming in. So um i mean the, the easiest way to experience is is to sit in a a completely dark room and almost anybody if well, if your brain works properly within 10 minutes you'll start hearing things and thinking that things are moving it's feedback in your own brain scientology creates these states but it doesn't actually it doesn't actually achieve any there are no clears there's nobody with psychic abilities i've met I don't know how many OTs, but not one of them has even claimed to have any psychic abilities, and certainly not one of them has ever demonstrated them. Does auditing make you feel good? That seems to me to be the essential question. That's yes, right. but staring at a wall can make you feel good too. Bouncing a ball can make you it, rocking backwards and forwards. Eating a playing a drumbeat repetitively, <laughs> you know? That's right. And did that make you enlightened? Did that make you capable to find the source of problems and make them vanish? Did it make you able to communicate with anybody on any subject as long as it hadn't been declared suppressive and you weren't talking about Scientology or, or your own case, your own problems or anything like that? It's, it's an absolute nonsense. It makes people fanatical and fervent. That's right. And it gives them, just as cocaine does, it gives them that rush, that sense, which they won't have again. And exactly. it takes a certain withdrawal time to, to come away from it and, and say, you know, um, maybe not. That's right. And, and the whole, it reframes the world, though. That's the thing that is incredible about Scientology and that we don't really see in the same way. You know, if you somebody gets into Hinduism or, or you know, they become a Sufi or what have you, they do change their attitude towards the world very definitely and sometimes quite positively and sometimes very negatively like 
things like the New Kadampa tradition where you know you worship a demon and hate right. the Dalai Lama. You know, so you've got stuff going on there. Right. Scientology completely takes people's minds over so that, and you and I both had this experience where you come to the stage where you go, I've got to reject all of this because I can't use it to examine itself. Exactly. And with me, it was, the da- it was the data series. That's right. You know, the, realizing that it didn't work. Well, it's an exercise in confirmation bias is what it is. Exactly. You know, and so it, it, it works beautifully if you already know. <laughs> it just confirms what you already knew you knew, you know. <laughs> And that's not helpful for critical thinking, you know, when you need to be challenged on things or you're actually trying to do an investigation. You know, there's two points here that I think really that this kind of boils down to if we're getting down to the brass tacks of what's wrong with auditing, um, which is that you are given an interpretation of your perceptions and, and events that happen to you that is completely false. It's, it's, it's based upon false principles so the framing is never awful. evaluate for the pre-clear right oh my god uh, well, just but, read this 400 page book and yeah we'll... exactly so so there's this interpretation of phenomena there's things that are going to happen to you in other words you sit down in a chair you get told to do things and it produces responses in your body and you and in your mind that's that that happens what what you're told to think about those experiences and how you're told to frame those experiences is given in language such as you are exteriorizing, you are out of your body, you are having an out of body experience, right? Or you are blowing charge. There is this concept in Scientology that you are walking around quite literally with an electric field around your body that is charged up by electrical charge that is that Hubbard claims is measurable. It, it's not. This is all bullshit, but this is what Hubbard says. And that these sheets of energy that surround you are actually your mental image pictures. And what you're doing in an auditing session is you are reducing, you're literally erasing that electrical charge so it's no longer carried around with you Mm. and therefore those traumatic events of your past will no longer have any influence on you Mm. and that's that's a very basic explanation for they use many 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 more words and give it to you in a lot more flowery language but at the end of the day that's basically what they're telling you is happening to you and they tell you all that before you go into the auditing session. So you, you never evaluate for the pre Exactly, <laughs> right? Then they have this rule, don't evaluate for the pre right? They break every one of their rules. They really mm-hmm. do. But this framing, this interpretation is powerful stuff, which is why I'm harping on it. Because you don't go into, just to, just to compare and contrast here for a moment, it's not that psychology and psychiatry have it all figured out. Far from it. But you would never go into a therapy session of any kind being told what's going to happen to you is A, B, C, and D. Mm. And then you now have all these expectations of you're going to go into this counseling session and A, B, C, and D better happen because that's what you've Mm. told that's what you're told is going to happen. You'll remember your birth. You'll it, remember your lives on other planets. That's You'll right. remember Zenu and, and all of his body things. Exactly. So, and, so that that explanation, that interpretation of events, is really important because it's mm-hmm. the setup. Yeah, it's the, it's the frame into which you will be poured. Exactly, yeah. and then quite simply, this is so simple it's almost painful. Uh, uh, you are put into a, as we just went over in detail, right? This is all hypnotism. And it's deceptive, covert hypnotism, because at no time are you told this is what's going on, right? You're going to be put in a trance state. And in this altered state of consciousness, we are going to develop memories in you 
that may or may not have ever actually happened to you, especially past life stuff. And you're going to adopt these memories as real, and you're going to have these memories of fantastical things that are going to blow your mind. This is where I think, and I wanted to ask you about this, this is where I think it finally made sense to me, guided imagination, (laughs) right? You're guiding this person's imagination to develop these pictures as though they're Polaroid pictures in your head, and framing all of this against this idea that this is all this charged up stuff so that when you have this kind of awakening from the trance state, which eventually, of course, you're going to wake up from. About three days later, usually. Yep. That's your, re- what, but in the session too, right? In the yeah. session, you have this snap out point. Yeah. And that's because- the point where... And the best word for it, you've all really nailed it with this, right, is euphoria. You have a euphoria. They get you, as you just said, you get high. The, Very the, good indicator. Yeah. The brain, and here's the point, is that the brain chemistry is pretty much exactly the same as when you are getting high, falling mm-hmm. in love, having a deep emotional experience. Dopamine, serotonin, endorphins, and That's oxytocin. Right. Yeah. That's right. And and one and and so the magic, quote unquote, of auditing is we're gonna tell you, we're gonna set you up to tell you all about what's about to happen to you. And then all we have to do is create a euphoric experience in your mind. And you are the one who's gonna do the rest. You're the one who's gonna connect all the dots and make it real to yourself. And this is where that famous Scientology phrase comes in. If it's true for you, it's true. So if you What's believe... true for you is true. That's right. Uh, which, which is a perversion of the Kalama Sutta, which was uh, a talk given by the Buddha, and uh, which I have very often repeated over the years, because he's saying, don't believe anything. Don't believe it because your parents told you, your teachers told you some angel whispered it in your ear, the gods said it to you, or I've told you. Check it for yourself. And Hubbard appears to be saying that, but what he's actually saying is, if you believe it, it is true. And there is the basis of auditing. And the way you check whether you believe it or not is on the (laughs) e-meter. All you're checking is whether you believe it or not. That's right. When you, a a friend of mine, Rex Basterfield, a dear friend, uh, he, he had a less than a year involved with Scientology because uh, he decided, well, it's in these books. I can do it myself. I don't need to pay. I think it was only six pounds an hour then auditing, but, um, but you <laughs> know, he was a young man. He didn't have that kind of money. <laughs> and it was like, oh, I've got creation of human ability. I'll do that. And over the years, he built up this past life memory of this town where he'd lived and his wife, you know, wasn't a believer. And so, you know, he wanted to prove that that this had happened. And so he, you know, here's the town. This is what, you know, what you'll find there. And eventually he went there with his wife and he found that nothing was as he'd believed it to be. Right. And here, here is the point, reality checking. First thing in reality checking is to say, what are the, you know, what does a clear achieve? What do releases achieve? What do, you know, they used to be. Until 1974, you were told what every OT level would do. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, they realized they could be sued over that. So it was uh, quickly withdrawn. I still have, I probably don't have it up here anymore, but the old copy of Scientology 0.8 actually has states attained the OT levels Mm -hmm. at the end of it. And um, exterior with full perception. Um, OT8, the, the ability to be at cause over physical and mental and physical matter, energy, space, and time. So that's what OT8 was meant to be, according to Hubbard. You could make the world appear and disappear when you, when you have these phenomenal abilities. I haven't seen any of that. You know, we'd have thought that the investigations into Scientology would have disappeared, and we'd have thought they wouldn't have needed to use the Guardian's office to harass people if they were able to just stop them using psychic abilities. So the first point is, does it actually work? And the answer is, no, it doesn't. Does it make you feel high? Yes, it does. 
does it give you a, a kind of matrix, let's use that, to live with it so that you can estimate the world according to this? Well, yeah, most certainly does. Yep. And it's not the only practice out there that, that gives you a, a view of reality to which you can subscribe. But it does. You know, my thing, when I started in 2013 writing for Tony Ortega's Underground Bunker, is because I'd realized that most people don't get over Scientology. Mm -hmm. A lot of people walk away and they say, it's all bullshit. You know, uh, Kerry Gleason, who used to be executive director international, I had dinner with him many years ago, uh, expecting, you know, some grains of truth or something. And we had dinner. At the end of the dinner, I said, so uh, what do you think of Scientology? And he said, it's shit. I didn't want to point out to him, and I didn't because I'm a courteous point person, but it's 30 years later, so I think I can now. <laughs> um, I don't even know if Kerry's still alive, actually, having said that. But I, I don't wish to upset him. But he was earning his living by using Ron Hubbard's administrative technology and teaching it to corporations. And he thought Scientology was shit. So you, you get this peculiar through the looking glass, is the way I look at it, the way you realize that. What you believed is actually the opposite of the truth. Yeah. For me, the, the fundamental trap in Scientology and many other practices, uh, religious and thera supposedly therapeutic, is the idea that, as, as Hubbard said, if you knew what was wrong with you, it wouldn't be wrong with you. Now, let's think about that. If you knew your leg was broken, then it wouldn't be broken. Exactly. So we're only dealing I, with mental I, Listen, let me, let me just interject real fast. That particular piece of information haunted me. That, that datum haunted me for about four or five years after I got out of Scientology. It took me forever to get rid of that idea. It's powerful. It's very, very powerful piece of information in Scientology. And it, it's something you'll find with Freud, Jung, Adler... Um, and many other therapy systems have this idea. I mean, recovered memory, the satanic panic, this idea that if you have certain symptoms, then inductively, they must have been caused by you being abused as a child. Right. We will therefore spend a couple of years digging and digging and digging and digging until you can generate. And the problem here is very simple. Memory and imagination play on the same screen in the mind. Yep. So if you're verifying something by using the e-meter and the e-meter is absolutely dodgy, you know, <laughs> it's just an absolute <laughs> nonsense. It, yes. it does not work. That's right. Um, it only tells you what you believe. And you already know what you believe. <laughs> Let's be honest about it. So you, you're going to check how, how long ago was this? And, and this gets very wild when you start looking at something like OT3, which is 75 million years ago. I am confident that Hubbard in 1966, when he started writing this down, had just read about the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. Off. And initially, some people were saying oh, it was probably about 75 million years ago. We now date it 10 million years more recently. Is that and if you, you have the wrong date? date that's where he came and up wrong, with that. Yeah. And of course, he also, of course, gives you the Canary Islands and Hawaii, which didn't exist until 9 million years ago. Exactly. Now let's get ge geological. Oh, uh, every, every single physical landmark characteristic, including the North Star, 75 million years ago, were completely different. And I mean, Hubbard just, it, it is the most nonsensical. When you fact check OT3, none of it pans out. Yeah, and my friend, dear friend, Peter Ford, uh, there's a paper that he wrote well, in the 80s where he did exactly that. He was studying geology at the time, and yeah. um, he did a degree at the Open University, a science degree, and he gives this very matter-of-fact analysis of, of these things. It's, it's like Angela Harris at um, the seminar at Toronto, the Getting Clear seminar, who was a PhD in toxicology, yeah. and she went through the purification rundown, and I was just... Wadness, you know, absolutely, you know, no rancor, but, you know, it's nonsense. It, exactly. it doesn't make sense. There is no science behind it. And they didn't bother to put any science behind it. But if we come back to this inner enemy idea, because I think 
this is a heck of a way to control people. Yep. That you tell them, you have this invisible enemy inside you. We'll call it the id yes. or the superego. We'll call it a demon, uh, a body thetan. We'll call it the reactive mind. We'll call it the unconscious mind. Now, of course, we have lots of unconscious processes. We don't think about everything we do. But there's not an individual inside you that's hiding everything from you and doing these things to you. Once you've convinced somebody of that idea, whether you think about it as charge, emotional charge, which Freud and Hubbard are both invested in. And of course, uh, there's a hydraulic aspect to this with, with Freud and Hubbard, that if you move this, then you'll have this extra space. It, it, it's not actually how we work. That's right. Um, so you turn somebody against themselves. And you say, you know, we understand your problem, but you don't. People who've done this throughout history are the psychopaths, the monsters, the, the people who want others to bow down to them. And while you know, I'm pretty sure that, that all of the religions have some very good ideas in, I've, studied, I've spent a lifetime studying them, there are all sorts of great ideas, and they're very quickly turned around. If you look at Christianity... Where are the prohibitions on, on sex? Why is sex such a terrible thing when you look at the Gospels? Well, the first hint you have of there being anything bad about sex is St. Paul, not Jesus, saying it's better to marry than to burn. So apparently you go to hell if you have sex outside marriage. I don't want to upset any Christians, but that's what St. Paul thought. But it's only by the fourth century when St. Jerome comes along that sex becomes evil, that Mary Magdalene, who there is nothing that says that she's a prostitute in the Gospels, it's something that's attributed to her much later on. And this whole idea of, you know, you've got this id, this beast, Sufis call it the nafs, the commanding self inside you, and you're at war with it. Yeah. And at least the Sufis have got this idea, well, you get friendly with it and Whereas the Christians are like, you deny it, you don't deny it, you, you stop it, you know, you flog yourself, you do all of these right. bizarre masochistic things, um, you know, Opus Dei or wherever. It, so there are great ideas about loving and being tolerant and the golden rule and all of that, and then they get bound up with this, you are not clever enough to run your own life. That's right. You need us to... You know, pay exactly. your ten percent to us, and you know, it's, it's, it's everything all, you've got it, in Scientology. A, a cynical person might think that organized religion was all about controlling people, looking at how this, how the evolution of this stuff works. And I, I don't consider myself a cynical person, but I, I kind of go in that direction on this particular topic for fairly quickly. <laughs> It's the word organized, isn't it? Yeah, And it's it is. who's being organized and why. I mean, exactly. I, I'm, I've recently watched the uh, existing two seasons of The Righteous Gemstones, and I am so delighted to see a beautiful comedy being made about megachurches and the exploitation that they visit upon their flocks. And uh, having John Goodman in the lead is you know, always a good idea. Um, as the yes. Coen brothers were rats, it's like, why, why is there always a fat man screaming and running in your movies? And I don't, I don't know whether it's Joel or Ethan, but he said, yeah, and why is it usually John Goodman? <laughs> 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 Just one of those things, you know. That's but, right. So it's the organising. It, it's the great and beautiful ideas about how we could create a wonderful civilization without um, insanity, war, or crime keep popping up and then they keep being used to create war insanity or exactly. crime exactly you know? exactly you know, look at what kirill in the russian orthodox church is doing to support putin's insane uh, behavior but but he's yeah. got the, the the support of only one of the patriarchs none of the other patriarchs of the other all of them every one of them the one in jerusalem the the greek Patriarch, the Ukrainian patriarch, the Polish patriarch, all of them have said, this is wrong. But Kirill is going, no, it, it's okay if, if Vladimir wants to do it. And so, you, you know, the, the point where the Pope was blessing guns in the First World War, 
the Archbishop of Canterbury was blessing guns, and I'm sure the German ministers were blessing them too. Yeah. Where you're going, I think you may have completely lost the plot this point. You know, the Prince of Peace, remember that, you know? Turn the other cheek, all that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, even seven and 70 times seven. That's how often you got to turn the other cheek before. But after that, right. you can throw hand grenades at people, apparently. But you've got to turn your cheek seven and 70 times seven. Right. On the point of what auditing is. Yeah. That Hubbard had, you know, again, I'm coming back to Never Believe a Hypnotist. So mm -hmm. you actually, if, if you've got the time, you can go to my channel and watch me reading it. And people have, thousands of people who are too lazy to read have come to my channel to see me. We got far more people looking at me reading it. And maybe it's just because I have such a, a gorgeous voice. But well, it's I your voice, John. So. Yeah, it's, your, it's the <laughs> melodic, it's the melody, you know. It's yes, <laughs> it's the ASMR aspect of my voice. <laughs> That's it. That's it. Yeah, so here we are. This is Ron Hubbard. And in order to get people to sit very alertly and do exactly what he says, he has another trick. He gives them examinations, star rate checkouts. So there, are this, there is this anxiety around a person's grade. And this comes yeah. forward until he finally gets up to a point in education where when somebody says the word examination to him, it not only push buttons him, but it also threatens mama, papa, love and general survival. It is a terrific whip. It keeps people in a state of confusion. And when their minds are slightly confused, they are in a hypnotic trance. Bingo. Anytime anybody gets enough altitude, it can be called a hypnotic operator. And what he says will act as hypnotic suggestion. Hypnotism is a difference in levels of altitude. There are ways to create and lower the altitude of the subject. But if the operator can heighten his own altitude with regard to the subject the same way, he doesn't have to put the subject to sleep. What he says will react as hypnotic suggestion. And again, coming back to Nibs Hubbard, mm -hmm. for whom I have a great respect, and I did interview him back in the day, um, before he dropped the body, after which he's not really been very available to me, I must say. And he, he came up with this thing. He said, look, my dad was making gods. Mm -hmm. What does that make him? So in terms of altitude, by the time you get to OTAs and are told that L. Ron Hubbard created the universe, how much altitude do you need? And what state are you in if you believe that? Because reality is that Ron Hubbard is scattered in the Pacific Ocean. He exactly. is gone. He has had his 21 years leave long since. And um, David Miscavige cancelled the issue where he said he was going to another sector of the, the galaxy and um, promoted Pat Broker to be the head of Scientology, of course, yep. and uh, became an admiral, you know, which I think is much better than being just a mere commodore. But this altitude that Hubbard is always pouring forth, the only person who can discover technology is Ron Hubbard. How much altitude is that? None of you, no matter how many levels you do, will ever be able to discover anything. Exactly. And you'll be self-determined as long as you do exactly what I say. That's right. Actually, I'm really glad that you brought this point up because I wanted to segue into this other aspect of Scientology auditing, which I think is also part and parcel of why it is so destructive to people. And that has to do with the actual framework of it, just the physical layout of it. Yeah. Um, because this authority issue is not a small thing. We're not just harping on this because it's just kind of like an interesting thing to talk about. This is actually key to how and why auditing is the way that it is and why it's harmful to you because it's not, you have to understand that it's not a therapeutic environment. If you're used to or think about counseling or therapy in terms of, you know, you go to see a psychologist, you go into their office, you pay for, you know, some time and you have a chat with them, right? And you're basically, you know, maybe there are some processes or some methodologies that are applied when it comes to um, uh, cognitive behavioral therapy or ESMR, whatever, you know, you have all these different things um, that you can kind of use technique wise in a psychology or psychotherapeutic session. But 
that the, that kind of idea is where these two things start diverging very wildly, auditing and, and therapy, because in an auditing session in Scientology, you aren't just invited into a room to have a chat. You are put into a locked room. And the auditor, this, the physical setup of every single Scientology session, even the ones that don't use an e-meter, is this way. The door is behind the auditor. You, as the preclear, are sitting up on a desk or on a table in front of the auditor. If you want to leave that room, you got to go through the auditor. And the auditors in Scientology receive hours, tens of hours, hundreds of hours, really, of training in how to keep you in that room against your will, if need be, because the dominating rule, one of the dominating rules in Scientology auditing is what turns it on will turn it off. And the other one of the other guiding principles in all of Scientology auditing is get the PC through it. And what those two statements are interpreted to mean is you're in that room and when the process begins, whatever technique or process they're using, and there's thousands of them in Scientology, but whatever one is being used, once that process is begun, you aren't done until the auditor says you're done and until the e-meter says you are done. What you have to say about it is the least important part of what's going on in that auditing room. The auditor doesn't care. The e-meter doesn't care. And L. Ron Hubbard doesn't care. Because their job is to drag you through that process, no matter how unconscious you get, no matter how much you scream, no matter how much you yell, no matter how much you pound on the door, no matter how many times you throw the cans at the auditor, they don't care. They're just going to pick you back up, manhandle you physically if need be. Again, this is part of their training. This isn't a couple bad apples, auditors who, who go off the reservation and are abusive. This is literally built into the training that you can't leave until they say you're done. There is not one therapeutic environment in this world outside of Scientology's claims to be therapeutic. There is no psychology, there is no psychiatry where they're going to do that to you unless you have been judged mentally incompetent and incapable of caring for yourself. But in Scientology, that's routine. Everybody's treated that way. And that all by itself, just those rules and framework I've laid out, create a coercive environment where therapy is all but impossible. So there is that added benefit to all of this too, is the, is the framework of it. So anyway, I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, but that's, that's very much part of this too. The, the, the purpose of auditing is to bring about compliance. Bingo. Intellectual and emotional compliance yep. with with the the rules and w one of the things that fascinated me a few years after i left and it, it, you use the expression guided imagination which i picked from the oxford handbook of hypnosis and we talked about it ages ago because everybody knows what hypnosis is don't they <laughs> not really no nope. whereas if you talk about guided imagination which is a full and complete definition of hypnosis just in itself the penny drops. Your imagination is being guided. You are, you know, having past life memories, remembering birth, what have you. Things that nobody can check. That's right. Uh, oh, actually, they can check them. When you have a, a past life memory of living in China, surely you'll now be able to speak Cantonese. <laughs> but you can't. That's when right. you lived in, you know, you were at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415, which is where, by the way, this gesture comes from, because the French used to cut the bowman's fingers off. And so the English bowman would say, I still got my fingers. Ah. It's come to mean something quite rude since then. But if you were at the Battle of Agincourt, you'd know that, wouldn't you? Of course. But Scientologists provide absolutely no evidence. If you look at the book, 
have you lived before this life? And notice, if you look to the first edition, the sessions that Cyril Vosper was involved in, and his name has curiously dropped down the memory hole since he wrote The Mind Benders. Um, but one of the things that really got me was in other systems, you have somebody who probably is using altitude, who probably is inducing some kind of compliance state in people. It's something you have to really watch for. It's why I say all psychotherapists need to understand yes. hypnotic processes. Because right. it's great having people do what you want, but that's not really the purpose of therapy. It's getting them to do what they want. Exactly. It's getting them to the point where they can do that. In Scientology, not only does the pre-clear or pre-OT, the analysand, go into a a compliant state where the imagination can be guided, but so does the auditor. And the key to this, the hypnosis comes about through fixation, repetition, and mimicry. I've used these for a long time. That if you, uh, davening, when uh, Hebrew scholars are doing something, they do this. So they'll do it in madrasas too, and it induces a state. Mm -hmm. playing drums, playing a fixed rhythm. You can see it, Moroccan drummers, they'll, they'll go into these far out states, staring at a wall, sitting in silence. You induce a state where the imagination starts to rise up and imaginary events start to occur. F fixed eye contact. I never got that. I learned to do it. And I viewed it as a form of meditation. It's called tratak in traditional Hindu texts, where one person sits facing another. The Tibetans practice it too. I was told, in fact, by uh, somebody in the Office of Special Affairs that they would get round to stopping all of these squirrels from using these Scientology techniques that they'd been using for a couple of thousand years. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, terrible people. <laughs> Fixation, repetition, and mimicry is the... These underline just about every auditing process there is, That's fixation, right. repetition. That's mm -hmm. right. Um, it's how advertising works through repetition, exactly. creating fixation. But the eye thing, when I came away from Scientology, it was like, I've got to stop staring at people. And I don't care if they want to call it confronting people, because that doesn't sound confronting somebody in an auditing session. Right, I'm confronting you now. Yep. Um, that doesn't sound right. It's, you know, Freud used to sit behind people, it said, because he was very frightened of eye contact. But, you know, oh, poor man. He changed his name, you know, his, his birth certificate says Sigismund, not Sigmund. And he decided it was, I hate to say this, he decided it was too Jewish. He changed from Sigismund to Sigmund. And later on, he would complain about having been persecuted as because he was Jewish, which I don't think really happened. I think Vienna had an in a Jewish intellectual culture that was very powerful. But by staring at somebody, you actually induce an altered state in yourself. It took me six months after I left to stop doing it. Yes. You know, realizing that this is taught to the police and the military the world over, and it's called the predator stare. It's a way of facing somebody down and dominating them. It's a, if you watch big cats, it's what they do. Yeah. They look at a creature and it goes, oh, and freezes. Grab it in the headlights. Those headlights are the lion's eyes. Right. It's got that control. And do you know what you know so what the example of this, by the way, that I just want to interject real fast? Tom Cruise. Mm. Every single time you see him, he is mm. ex he is modeling this behavior. Oh. This this confrontational. I'm in your face. I'm right here. I'm big and powerful. I'm the most. I can jump over a sofa. Yeah, exactly. Right. That, but, but really, I mean, if you, if, if you want a live demonstration of what we're talking about and how off putting it is and how kind of mm. weird it is, Tom Cruise is actually a really great example. Absolutely. He is. Yeah. Mm. So we first of all get the fixation, which is, you know, I'm staring at you. You then have this, the repetition. Every auditing session is meant to be like every other auditing session. It, it runs them out if they go into the reactive mind. 
oh dear, you didn't warn us that auditing sessions could go into the reactive mind. That's an interesting thought. So they can actually make things worse. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, well, I guess you could look at it that way. A mimicry. Indeed, there are uh, processes of mimicry, the uh, control communication havingness, the CCH yes. processes, where you try and follow somebody's hand or... Um, Again, these are all compliance techniques. They're always, but the auditor enters into the experience with the pre-clear. They too are in a, an altered state where they are guiding the imagination of the other person, but their own imagination has been guided. And right. that fixation, that repetition, that doing it exactly the same way, I'll repeat the auditing question. Okay, continue. You know, that, that he, he dares use the terms. These are not questions in order to. They're commands. Mm -hmm. That's they right. have to get compliance. The, um, the training routines where you learn how to bully people and control them um, are called the upper indoctrination training routines. The auditing itself is called processing. It's not as if he was hiding anything. Exa I was just about to say, that's exactly, the language is right in the open. Yeah, it's just and reverie. What, what you know, he right was, at the start, reverie. That, exa right trance. That's right. It, it, what, the, the trick and the thing that fools Scientologists, and this is such an interesting mental lecture trick that Hubbard would do, because he did it over and over and over and over and over again is throughout the history of his lectures, you will see him introduce these concepts and discuss these control techniques and then throw the zinger in, throw the, he'll flip the script every single time with, but this isn't what we're doing, see, because hypno hypno hypnosis puts you to sleep. Scientology wakes you up, see? So you get this flip the script on you all the time where Hubbard acknowledges he is controlling you. These are compliance techniques. This is about controlling you. He flat out says it. But then he says, but we're controlling you only until you can control yourself, see? Mm. We're only Which will happen sometime after you leave Scientology. Exactly. exactly. Yeah, I mean, the stop. most perfect one is, is one in the Philadelphia <laughs> doctorate course. Six weeks listening to me and you've got a doctorate. Yep. That's an e easy way to go. <laughs> Where he says, and I've been criticised for quoting this, he says, we have ways here of making slaves. Yeah. And I'm criticised because I don't always add the second part of it. Let's make sure none are made because I don't think it's relevant because these techniques can be used to make slaves. That's right. And what are we looking at when we look at the Sea Org? Exactly. Slaves. That's right. That's right. Having uh, in lived terms it for of, 17 I'm, years, I, I, I will I'm tell you I, that I'm is no this... exaggeration. Hmm. Just yeah. saying. We, it, it's modern slavery, it's human trafficking yeah. that's happening there, and it's despicable yes. that no government will take them on because they're scared of... They think Scientology is this big, powerful thing, and, it, yeah, it's got billions of dollars, that's true. Um, and when when building prices go down, it won't have, but, that's right. you know, don't put all your eggs in one basket, you fool. Um, but it's only got 25,000 members. So how dangerous is it, you know, in, in, in real terms? But they did. They scared the living daylights out of enough bureaucrats and politicians. And, you know, we know this background program where Hubbard was collecting dirt on people so he could use it. You know, again, this contradiction, the double bind, which is written in Scientology, it's one of the reasons it works. One of the best examples runs journal 1967. Mm -hmm. RJ67, where he announces the discovery of OT3. And he talks about the dogs barking at the wheels of the fire engine, and we just ignore them. We're going to the fire. And later in the same lecture, he says, Mary Sue has hired professional intelligence agents to look into the background of a, a press baron and the British prime minister. And the, so dogs barking at wheels, 
one concept. Other concept, I'm going to screw anybody that gets in my way. That's right. And I, I'm going to return to, the, I finally found the quote, quotation I wanted mm. about altitude, yeah. um, which I've just lost again. God. Isn't that, isn't that wonderful, you know? Well, this authority thing, I mean, while you're looking for that, I'll just comment here that this is this is what yeah. that, you know, locking the door, having an e-meter, having all of this formalized process connected with this, having, making it, making it a really big deal that you have a highly trained auditor, that, that auditors have a classification system, which ranks them basically, and Mm-hmm. allows for pr- charging higher prices completely arbitrarily. Mm-hmm. Why would a class 12 auditor be any better than a class zero at a great, you know, at, at, a, at, a, at a level zero process? There really shouldn't be any difference, but we can charge you five times as much for the mm-hmm. class 12 to deliver this to you. You know, this kind of thing. There's this altitude authority thing is, is really so built into the structure of Scientology. And the reason I'm going to harp on it while you're with this quote is, um, is because it becomes so there and so uh, pronounced that you forget about it. You stop seeing it. You stop <laughs> thinking about it that way. But w- what we need to point this out, because it's actually intrinsic in the entire relationship between the auditor and the preclear in every single auditing session that the auditor has altitude and authority over the preclear and that is again not a therapeutic relationship no so no it, it it's very much you know I, i've I, as you know i've done a number of shows with karen de la carrier yeah and um she, there are only 50 people trained to class 12. They've stopped training them. I don't know why. Yep. Um, and they she are was making one of those. Them now. They do have them. They can do it again. They did have to oh, make some class 12s oh, I'm now. Pleased. But they do it but, very differently. Mm. They actually redid the check sheets. So you don't have to do, you can go from a, a level five auditor, you can jump right up to class 12. Uh, yeah, squirrels. They, they took squirrels. out. They, they squirreled it basically. Miscavige took yeah. out the briefing course. Took out class eight. You don't have to have that stuff in order to do class twelve. But let's just throw in a couple of comments that that if you have a misunderstood word, you will commit overts. You will crimes, transgressions, sins. And um, I'd like to point out that most Scientologists don't know the meaning of the word squirrel. And I've never met anybody who's done OT3 who knows what a cherub is. Even though a cherub blows a trumpet, they think it's a little baby. Oh. Rather than an enormous angel from the Old Testament. So, you know, uh, that's why it's not working. Right. Everybody just doesn't yeah, they've understand. Got, they've got a misunderstood word. They don't understand cherub. That's why Scientology is failing around the world. <laughs> Yeah, but so they're they're now you know squirrel. Do you know you know you will know the origin of the term squirrel probably. Yeah. What? Well, which is a squirrel they're cage? They're chasing, they're chasing after nuts, and Hubbard said that was crazy, and they're just going round and round well, and round. Won't get anywhere. It, it it's what we call a hamster wheel. Yeah. in this country. Yeah, a squirrel cage. It's not a, a term that's used here. And yeah, the idea that they're just going round and round in a wheel. Yeah. And why not leave them alone then? Because they're not going to harm anybody, are they? Why these vicious campaigns to destroy them? Ah, oh, they're not paying 10% to the organization. I think I've understood it. I've had a cognition. There you go. Which, by the way, is a really fine word, as so many are in Scientology, because it just means a thought. That's right. It doesn't mean a revelation of any kind, an epiphany. Mm. Um, but as he explained in Propaganda by Redefinition of Words, you can control people by changing the meanings of words. So George Orwell explained that in the appendix to 1984 rather better than Hubbard, I think. Yes. But, so and, the and altitude Hubbard, of quote, course, wrote that. Think, he quotes from Orwell. Yeah, he's he's aware of Orwell. Oh, yeah. Um, and, uh... I think, I yeah, think anybody that, who gets into the cult game picks that up, picks up the loaded language component really quickly. It seems to be one of the uh, things that, that they all glom onto very quickly. 
Yeah, the, and and the, to to redefine the world, world they create a complex language. Yeah, and the commonplace is people coming to study. Uh, the altitude there is is you're going well. This sounds like gibberish, but that's because I am not developed enough to understand it. Exactly. And the truth is, yes, you are developed enough to understand it. It is gibberish. Hubbard said this, in altitude teaching, somebody is a great authority. He is probably teaching some subject that is far more complex than it should be. He has become defensive down through the years, and this is a sort of protective coating that he puts up along with the idea that the subject will always be a little better known by him than by anybody else. Exactly. And that there are things to know in this subject which he really wouldn't let anybody else in on. This is altitude instruction. And as we have seen elsewhere, this is hypnosis. It's a hypnotic relationship where you're never going to actually get out of this particular squirrel cage <laughs> which is Scientology. You're going to be chasing your tail as an auditing junkie, as somebody who's trying to get this experience again. Um, and the experience functions this way, as far as I can tell. You get high in auditing, and within three days, you're not high anymore. Mm -hmm. It does happen sometimes. I met a guy quite early on who was all bandaged because he'd walked through a plate glass door, and he was grinning. Because he said, I was exterior. Again, it wasn't very useful, was it? Not exactly. Wow. And so that dissociation from, from your physical self. I mean, leaving Scientology for me, one of the, the great moments was going, oh, I don't have to hate having a body. Being, I, I can be a self, which is a complete union of mind, body, and spirit. Right. And I can like myself. I'm not going to go as far as loving myself because that's a bit narcissistic. But it's okay to feel all right about myself. And isn't it great having this meat body, you know, rather than having a doll body, which sounds rather freaky, really. It sounds a bit perverted to me. But, you know, sex robots. <laughs> um, you know, isn't it great having this thing that I can feel the temperature around me and I can eat food, which is grand, and have sex, which is pretty nice too. That, that this peculiar revulsion, this wanting to get out of the body. Why? To, do, to go where? How, how, you know, this, you know, I'm allowed to perceive and experience things. I have eyes. And they don't have little gold discs in front of them, as Elrond Hubbard said. It, it is incredible, isn't it? When you go back into all of the oh. nonsense the man spoke. Oh my God! Had, oh God! So Those things the about the golden orbs. Authority. Oh. He's a greater authority than anybody else. He That's knows right. things that nobody else knows. Well, let me. Subject, you know, let me let me throw something out real fast. I wanted to get, I wanted to see what you thought of this because um, it's exactly on point here, which is. Isn't it interesting that when you try to break down the cosmology, the mythology, a lot of the ideas that Hubbard would throw out over the years, whether it was space opera or technique or methods or why the mind works the way it does or whatever, you are constantly frustrated in Scientology by the fact that all of the roads never really lead to a satisfying conclusion. Mm. They're all half roads. They're all cul-de-sacs. They leave you hanging. You never do find out who the hell is the fourth invader force? Why are they so pissed at the fifth invader force? Who are Why do the fifth people? invader force have big hands? Right, yeah, they got these great big claws. Okay, what, what, where? And they that? live on Mars and Venus. Oh, come on, guys. Yeah, on what is Venus? that about? Like, you never. The temperature's get... 400 degrees. <laughs> well, well, beyond all of the, the sci fi bullshit, it's just interesting how the very fact that Scientology is littered with these mysteries, these mm -hmm. half answers two questions that you have sticks you to it it certainly did me i was glued hubbard nailed it when he came up with the concept and i'm sure he didn't come up with it but 
when he talks about the concept of a mystery sandwich, mm. right? This glue that sticks you to this unanswered question, this unresolved issue. Here's half the data, you know, but I'm not going to give you the full story. And you keep thinking if you're a dedicated, loyal group member, mm. well, the answer must be around here somewhere, and I just need to stick to it, and I'll eventually get it. And you mm. don't realize that the subject matter that you're involved in is Swiss cheese. It's so full of holes, you're never going to fill in those blanks. But I just mm. wanted to point out, just kind of mechanically, Scientology is littered with these half answers, and it really does mm. kind of stick you to it. And and it's the first thing, you know, when you write stories, and I've written novels over the years and all sorts of things, the first thing you learn is that you've got to tempt a person. And there's a, a great play called The Winslow Boy by Terence Rattigan, and this boy runs on stage, and he's got an envelope in his hand, and you're already there. What's in the envelope? That's right. That's right. And Hubbard was a storyteller. He was a fairly good storyteller. Stephen King has said that fear is possibly the best story ever written. But I'm not, you know, apart from his book on writing, which I think is brilliant, and the movies like Dolores Claiborne and what have you, I'm not a big fan of Stephen King's writing, you know, because <laughs> it scares me. You know? So, I, you know, his opinion about Ron Hubbard, you know, Mitt Romney said Battlefield Earth was the best book he'd ever read. And you're going... Have you read any other books? Right, exactly. <laughs> Try Dostoevsky sometime. Um, right, but but yeah, you you're being you're being told a story all the time. When I came to to write what is now, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky, which let's face it, anybody who's been in Scientology ought to read. And I do accept that most people will use one of the stolen copies on the internet, and I am mad about that because. It was six years of my life doing that book, and, and I've done nothing but lose money over it over the years. Yeah, when well, it you went guys buy the book? Just buy the book? It's really not that yeah. much, guys. Come on. Yeah, or, or, or if you've already bought it, go onto our Patreon accounts and give us five bucks a month, you know, for, for exactly. being so helpful. But nonetheless, when I came to write the book, there were a series of things I had to do, and, and I wrote and rewrote. Originally, the book was about my experience with Captain Bill. <laughs> And uh, it was called The Scientology War, and it was about what happened in 82, 83. And I realized that nobody would understand it. An editor at Collins, then the biggest publisher in the world, worked and worked for three months to try and get them to publish it. And he, said, he confessed to me that what delighted him about the original manuscript was that my head was still halfway into it. And uh, I didn't feel that that was a compliment. But I had to, well, Okay, this is Captain Bill. What's Scientology? Oh, God, what's Scientology? Okay, so I know I'll write four chapters about my time in Scientology so you see how somebody becomes a member. That's since been used by a terrorism expert to show how smart people get caught up in crazy ideas. Thank you so much for that. Then, okay, Hubbard's biography, and my focus was he's a liar. He said this. It isn't true. Mm -hmm. His grandfather didn't own a quarter of Montana. He's not related to the Count de Wolf. He, you know, it's nonsense. But I showed that by showing that he contradicted his own statements. Mm. You know, crippled and blinded at the end of World War II in my philosophy. Down in Hollywood, beating up petty officers at the end of the war in um, Communication and Isness from 1957. Mm. And there's actually a third account, which, which is neither of the above. But I... So that Russell Miller, when I worked with him, wanted to just write a biography and did a fantastic job with Bareface Messiah. When I got to the end of the book, I said, well, what does this actually mean? I've got the history of Scientology, I've got Hubbard's biography, I've got my experience. What is the cosmology of Scientology? And having been involved for nine years and then spent six years researching and talking, talking to and reading material, there were 150 people who informed that book. And a lot of books, Janet Reitman included, have got less than 10 people involved, 150 people. The main witness was Ron Hubbard. The book is, half of it is drawn from things he said. So, you know, he's an irref 
irrefutable witness when it comes to the life and times of Scientology. But what is the cosmology of Scientology? And it's never been written down. The data series talks about altered importance. Well, what are the important bits in Scientology? Well, you know, where do we come from? What's going on? So I then went, OK, we'll start with the first factor. Before mm. the beginning was the cause, and the entire purpose of the cause was the creation of effect. And we'll then go to the first axiom of Scientology. Life is basically a static. A life static has no motion and no meaning, which is an interesting point. It's basically nothing. Oh, that's an interesting thought. It's nothing. You know, we're, we're going to get you back to be nothing. At the end of Scientology, we'll have reduced you to zero. We'll have taken the infinity of the physical universe and collapsed that to nothing. I'm not sure I want to do that with the physical universe, by the way, because that sounds like a pretty dull thing to do. All those hundreds of billions of galaxies, just nothing. And raise me to infinity. That sounds like very severe narcissism to me. It doesn't sound like a worthy therapeutic goal. And then you're looking on and going, well, OK, so the, the most obscure piece of information in Scientology is, are we part of one big thing? Buddha mm -hmm. mind, Nirvana, mm -hmm. um, Paramatman in the Hindu system. Uh, are we in communion with God? No. But the only place I know of, and there may be another one, and if somebody knows one, please put it in the comments, but is uh, Route 2, Process 47 in um, Creation, Creation of, of Human Ability, ability where yeah. he says he has, it's called separateness. And he's proved that we don't come from a great mass of theta. Yeah. That we are all individuals. Yeah. And as Monty Python add to that, you're all different. I'm not. Um, it, it, and, you know, the whole construction of, of, you know, we're imagining the universe, all of us together, uh, chanting space particle position at every moment of our, our time. I'm not. It's not true. I have right. never chanted space particle position until this evening. And I probably never will. The, the point is that, and, and the time spans, you know, when you get to History of Man, which I know you've recently done a piece on. I did a piece with Mike Rinder. And he said, let's do a thing about History of Man. And I said, okay. And I read it. And I, and I hadn't read a Scientology book for 35 <laughs> years or something. And it's like, this is garbage. And I was wondering why the new editions had changed the dates. Because I think that's squirreling. I think David Miscavige is squirreling. And I was talking with Yuval Law and I said, you know, it's uh, 76 trillion years ago or something. And he said, no, no, it's 60. And then found, no, it's, I said 60, he said 76. That diff he changes the date through the book. Now, I think losing 16 million, million years, which is a lot longer than this universe has existed for, that is very careless. Yeah. That is not scientific or philosophically a good thing to do. Yeah. But... Somehow, we, you and I, relatively intelligent people, were completely taken in. Completely. completely. By something that's abject nonsense. Oh, yeah. To say. Oh, yeah. To the point that, and history of man, here's the, here's the, here's the really disgusting part, is, is history of man is just prep. Because you, <laughs> you do history of man, and then later, 16, what is it, uh, uh, so that's 52, so 60, yeah, not even, like, 10 years later, 11 years later, Hubbard is writing at St. Hill about goals and implants that were 350 trillion trillion years ago. Yeah. Right, being fed to you. <laughs> I mean, he's giving out dates that are just, that are just ludicrous, right? I mean, there's, there's ludicrous dates. And, and, and times and associates this idea that, that we've been banging around in this universe, in some form of physical universe, for trillion, trillion, for four quadrillion years. You're like, what are you, what? I mean, these are inconceivable periods of time. Mm. And of course, lending more credibility, if you accept that kind of framework of reality, to the idea anything could have happened to you during that time nothing is out of bounds and so anything you imagine 
guided or otherwise in your auditing sessions clearly must be true. You know, it's just this whole milieu of fantasy acceptance that auditing is really built on top of. So if it sounds like we've gone wildly off topic, we haven't because this is all part of the framework of what goes on in an auditing session. Mm-hmm. So just to just to kind of bring that yeah, smack it, back down to the theme I mean, of our show here. It, it took me six years to put together a piece of Blue Sky. I had nine years in Scientology, so that's 15 years to research a period that begins in March 1911. Um, goes up. So there's 80 years that I'm researching, and that took me 15 years. It took Ron Hubbard two weeks to research 76 trillion years. I interviewed his son because he was one of the three people that did the research. Yes, please talk about this. <laughs> um, and what Nib said was, you know, he was 18 years old yep. against his mother's and his grandparents' advice. He wanted to go and hang out with his dad. Fresh out of high and, school. Uh, yeah, fresh out of right. school. He's 18 years old. Yep. And he turns up, and um, I think Mary Sue was 19 at this time. <laughs> so, you know. Right. And um, Hubbard, his dad, gives him a handful of amphetamines and says, lie down on the couch and tell me what goes on. Yep. They spent two weeks taking an enormous amount of speed which Hubbard, of course, did recommend frequently in lectures, in Dianetics. You have to grab hold of something, grab hold of Benzedrine. You know, Hitler and Hubbard were both very keen on speed. Yes. But so was Johnny Cash, so some good people have been too. But, um, you know, the, the, the one that Hitler took was called Pervitin. He used to take it wow. alongside cocaine. You know, and there are people out there who think he was a great man. He wasn't. He was only five. Um, but... They, you know, there's two weeks of research for 76 trillion years. I mean, that is some heck of a, a drug experience. Well, that's why they needed have. the speed, see? They needed to cram it all in. <laughs> no, it's, you can't, you know, and of course, when you get to, you've got the Piltdown Man and all of this, it's like, oh, oh, no. And there you've got a fundamental concept of auditing, which is, if you can imagine it, it's true. That's right. That's right. And uh, that's not a reliable principle. Um, at the moment, Vladimir Putin imagines that Vladimir Zelensky, who is Jewish, is a Nazi. And Russian troops have tortured people to try and get them to, a, where are the Nazis? Show us the Nazis. It's like, oh, talk about a group delusion. Oh, my God. Um, yeah. And, and we have the same thing in Scientology. There's a simple point which, which comes down to critical thinking, which Thule's uh, pair and Thule's grandson in, in Straight and Crooked Thinking, one of the great books that everybody should read. Yes. And that is a very simple point. If you get emotional when discussing something, you are not thinking critically. Bingo. You're thinking emotion. That's right. And so... You know, I have a couple of friends as theologians, and I can sit around for hours and talk about my unusual view, eccentric view of Christianity with them, and they don't get angry at me. People who get angry at me are the ones who think they might be wrong. That's right. They get defensive. And so we have the suppressive person who we can't talk to because, hey, they're more powerful than Scientologists. <laughs> Exactly. That's the truth of it, you know. Well, exactly. That and more double binds, more contradictions. It's rife throughout yeah. the whole thing, and it's very, it's very funny to me that people can be made aware of these things and still think that so, that there's something really legit, incredible to the Scientology. Didn't you have any wins, process. Chris? Didn't you have any wins? Right. Exactly. When the entire yeah, loads of them, but when, so what? I have them every day. You know? well, exactly, you can have a win eating a Twinkie. I try to point this out to people. You know, it's like it, that is not proof. The fact that you had a positive experience at something, and this is not just Scientology auditing. This is across the boards. The fact you had a positive experience doesn't, at the end of the day, mean anything. Mm. It really doesn't. I, I'm sorry to burst everybody's bubble, but it really is not proof of anything it, other than you had a good experience. You had an experience that you have now judged 
as good, as positive, as constructive, as something you wanted to experience. Great. Mm. Wonderful. That's awesome. Mm. But don't think that proves anything because it doesn't, mm. you know, and that's really and the bottom I, line I, on it. I have to say that before I got into Scientology, I, I'm, I'm a happy sort of soul, but I think that always has on the other side of it a certain melancholy when you look at the reality of the world. Yeah. But as a teenager and that state where you are much more prone to infatuation than you will be later on when you become <laughs> cynical like us. <laughs> right. um, but I, I was blown away by, you know, I was reading Lao Tzu, I was reading Zen, I was reading all these things that were just so exciting and interesting. And after a year in Scientology, so I was 19 when I got in, after a year, I realized that although I was still a cheerful person, I was used as, you know, if you wanted a floating needle in the course room, you just had John sit down and mm -hmm. there it would be always. Um, I, I liked people, you know, that was my nature. And uh, a year in, I realized that the revelation, the epiphany, had actually slowed down since I got into Scientology. Yeah. And it continued to slow down until eventually, by the time I left, um, I was really very confused. Um, I'd done OT3, and then I'd uh, Andy Nolchus suggested that I quicked my auditing. I, I took the same amount of time as anybody else. It, it's such an excuse. Um, it, why is it the fault of the person that had it done to them rather than the fault of the organization that did it and took the money for it? Well, you know, right. according to Osa John, I'm an overt product of the RPF because of the three years and three months that I spent doing a thousand hours of FPRD clearly wasn't done right. Because look at me. <laughs> so that's a false purpose rundown for uh, yeah, evil you know, intention. Your pulling. Thousand right. hours of finding your false purposes. Oh no, I, I in the whole time I was in Scientology, uh, hundred maybe two hundred hours of auditing in nine years. I was I was quick. I got things very quickly and mm -hmm. moved ahead. Mm -hmm. But after OT3, everything had changed until doing getting onto the OT levels. I mean, OT2 was pretty weird too, actually. <laughs> Goals, problems, masses. But uh, yeah, okay, it's a preludium two, three. And then you read the OT3 pack and go, oh no. I've spent seven years getting here. I, I fixed a house up and used the profit to buy this. Yes. And it's, and I went and I said, this didn't work for me. And the, there's this peculiar moment where the guy who was selling it, the registrar, had moved over from being the top, uh, the technical secretary for the United Kingdom, because he'd realized that he got a 2% commission as a registrar and you could have a car and you could afford to smoke real cigarettes rather than roll-ups and stuff right. like that. He's a lovely guy. And he shocked me because I expected he'd say, right, you need a retread, you need to you know, pay half the money and do it all again. And he said, um, and this guy had been the senior case supervisor in the UK. He said, um, a lot of people find that. Wow. You need OT4. Right. So yeah. I did OT4. I borrowed the money and did OT4. And a, a week after OT4, I went in and went, not really experiencing any difference. You know, the druggy body thetans, I don't think were giving me any problem anyway, frankly. You know, they were too stoned or, or, or wherever they were. But so it's like... And he looked at me again with a straight face, you know, TR zero, and he said, a lot of people find that. <laughs> it's like, is this, uh, is this written in the script somewhere? So I did 25 hours of OT5, and by the time I finished that, they'd given me the top auditor in the UK, Richard Reese, who was at that point the tech sec UK or what have you. And he only had two people who was auditing. I'd complained about the auditor I had and the smell. And we were in this room, and the auditor couldn't, He's an OT5 auditor, and he doesn't know how to open the window. And he smelled. And it uh, was like, open the window. You know, uh, it's like, it's but of course, the window opened onto the walk, the breezeway at St. Hill, so anybody could hear what was going on in the session. OT5, <laughs> oh, no, what a nonsense. But Richard Rees had me in the afternoon and Van Morrison in the morning. So I got the best. And it just finished me off. It was like, this is such a waste of time. Yeah. And I, I hung around for about a year after that. 
um, still believing that it was my fault. Yeah, which is, of course, the base of all cult manipulation. That's right. You didn't do it properly. That's right. That's why you're not exterior with full perception. That's why you can't solve any problem. That's why you can't communicate freely with everyone, any source, because you falsely attested. Exactly. It's, it's like, not that Scientology I, I, doesn't work, see. It's that you didn't do it right. Let me give you an example of something. When I left and I started talking to people who were, you know, thinking that maybe they didn't want to belong to the mother cult anymore, I sat down with a delightful woman who sadly is no longer with us, but she, was, she became a great friend. It was the first time I met her. I sat down with her and I gave her my spiel about what was wrong with Scientology. And she looked very confused. I thought she's going to throw me out. And uh, never met her before, you know, turned up at her house, actually to talk to her husband who wasn't in. And um, she looked at me and she said, does that mean I don't have to do it anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, could be. She said for 15 years, she'd been trying to complete the communication course, the first course. And the reason she couldn't complete it was because unlike all the rest of us, she was honest. And when it said that you do a training routine to a major, stable win, she said, how will I know it's stable? Ah, uh, uh, uh. 15 years. Damn. Well, I know it's stable. And Damn. it isn't stable. Well, of course not. None of it is. And it makes people, it can make people very unstable. And I mean, I, I did end up yeah. talking, I gave a talk at Haywards Heath um, Mental Hospital, and um, they asked me to. That was my excuse. And I thought, you know, a couple of people will turn up. I knew they'd just had a case because that's why they wanted to talk to me. They had a German guy who had gone, excuse me, batshit crazy. In fact, not batshit, his own shit, which he was smearing over the walls. Uh. And um, I was astonished because I still had that thing, you know, these psychiatrists, you got to watch them, you know, they don't really care about people. I also knew they worked very long hours, nurses and so 14 staff turned up to this talk because they'd had so many OT3s. And they oh, really wanted wow. to try and understand it. And so I said, well, don't give them antipsychotics. You know, let them calm down. Yeah, yeah. And just talk nicely to them every now and then. And it's it's an acute psychosis. They'll, I mean, people usually cycle down in yep. psychosis anyway. It's schizophrenia, what have you. There, there are episodes. Yep. And um, But it, it was fascinating to know that every, certainly every six months, they were getting somebody from St. Hill mm. who was in a very serious psychiatric state. And, of course, it has to be said that the checking in Scientology is so extreme to make sure that you've not had psychiatric treatment before. So these are people they were driving into madness. That's right. With, with, with these procedures. Indeed, on OT3, one of my great friends who I met at, at Mosley in Birmingham, um, she was one of the most ebullient people. She was just wonderfully happy. And she detested to clear and all of this. She was the reason many of us carried on in Scientology there. And um, I know my friend Rex, who I mentioned before, that that he was, she was just delightful. And I met her, I hadn't seen her for four years. And I met her down in East Grinstead. And she was as if made of stone. She was just solid and unhappy. And a couple of years later, on leaving Scientology, she was able to talk about it. And what had happened was very simple. She had gone to do OT3, and she could not find any little demons, any body titans. And she had just been crushed by the weight of criticism that there was something wrong with her. So you're going, when a sane person... You know, it's it, H.G. Wells in the uh, country of the blind. The one-eyed man is king. Right. And uh, in his story, H.G. Wells points out, no, in the country of the blind, the one-eyed man will be destroyed. And she was such an example of Scientology doing that. If you don't comply with our beliefs, 
which we have not bothered in any way to prove as factual. Mm. We've got a man who claims to be a nuclear physicist, though, of course, in a lecture in September 1950, Introduction to Dianetics, he explains that he failed the course in atomic and molecular physics. He never took a course in nuclear physics, which is a quite different thing from atomic physics, but he failed the course in atomic physics. And he's standing up saying, I'm a scientist who's taken the teachings of the East and you know, I studied with gurus in the East. No, you didn't. Exactly. You, in China, once went to a Lama temple and said the monks sounded like bullfrogs. And that's all there is in the writings of Aaron Hubbard about gurus. They claim to study with them in India, China, Tibet, and Mongolia. Three countries he'd never visited and China where he went on two holidays as a kid. Exactly. But it all, everything is altitude. Everything is, I did this and I did that. It's, it's not true. And he didn't develop any supernatural powers. He certainly, in terms of his communication skills, he was banned from this country. Oh, well, exactly, <laughs> exactly, and others. I mean, he just got routinely, I mean, he just got just literally kicked out of Rhodesia. And, and that's a story that's worth telling, which most people don't know, because he came away from Rhodesia saying that he'd proved that an OT could not function on his own. Yes. That you had to have a group, and it was a lie. I interviewed the man who was with him in Rhodesia, um, Morley Glazier. And Morley Glazier, get this, got caught stealing government documents on Hubbard's behest, at Hubbard's behest, and was sent to jail for it. That's how he was thrown out of Rhodesia. And he'd always That's have somebody part of else the story to do I've the, never the heard. Criminal. Yeah. Okay. Well, isn't that interesting? Isn't yeah. that interesting? And it goes back. It, it, the first one I found was a man called James Elliott, who in 1952 stole the mailing lists of yep. um, Don Purcell's organization in Wichita. That's right. And I've got letterhead from Hubbard with James Elliott, business manager on it. And I've got 31 group mailings that Hubbard sent out to that mailing list yep. in which he attacked Purcell who was desperately trying to save him. Right. You know? That's right. Just this paranoid... Oh, he was the worst. Constant paranoia. He was the worst. I mean, he bankrupted it twice. He got a bailout, and then he screwed that guy over. Hubbard could not... See, I think what we're... I think what we're, you know, harping on this stuff or talking about this stuff is because there's this weird idea out there that... Well, it's not weird, but there is this idea out there, especially you see this amongst some of the independent Scientologists... <laughs> where we're going to separate the man from his work, right? And we're going to show how, you know, Hubbard was an asshole and a bastard and, a, and all of this, but his work is so genius. And you have to look at the nature of why Hubbard was a bastard. Why was Hubbard, you know, why, why did people get out of his orbit within a year of meeting him? Within a year of Dianetics being published, every single person who had supported him and helped him along the way to get that book published was completely estranged and completely like, get me away from this guy, right? There is one exception. There is one exception. You're quite right. Art Sepos cancelled the book Dianetics because mm -hmm. he said it was fraudulent. Joe Winter wrote yep. Doctor's Report on Dianetics to say, I like Dianetics, Hubbard is evil. Don Rogers was on the board of every foundation until 1954. Mm. And he left because he felt his case was handled. So when I, Antonio uh, Tegas, got the letters that Don answered my questions in, about 15 pages of really quite astonishing information, no axe to grind. Didn't dislike Hubbard at all. Thought Hubbard was a bit eccentric, not very good with people, and spent money like water. I heard that phrase so often. Mm -hmm. But... As you say, almost everybody yeah. deserted him, you know, or, or killed themselves. There are quite a number of people who are close to him. Um, the suicide rate in Scientology, by my reckoning, and I did work on this in '93, is ten times higher than the American average, because often it's desperate. It's the last thing. John Neugebauer, who helped to arrange Philadelphia doctorate course, he killed himself because Hubbard had promised him that he could get rid of the traumatic images of bulldozing bodies into pits after the, mm. the Pacific War. Right. And 
you know, he was Helen O'Brien's uh, partner. Oh, right. That's um, right. And they were, they uh, within a year, they were uh, estranged and out of there. Well, Helen, Helen wrote the, I think, astonishing book, Dianetics in Limbo, yeah. which, which was never really, was never published. Uh, there is a copy in the Library of Congress, but she sent me the full manuscript along with the famous religion angle letter. What do you think of the religion angle? We right. could make more money. <laughs> exactly. Okay, that's the reason to become a religion. We get it, you know. But Exactly. So, yes, it, so and, I'm just and that thinking... idea that Hubbard could be a complete psychotic who developed something that's going to make you healthy. That's the point. I, the, the publishers, when Blue Sky was originally published in 1990, the, the, their editor insisted that I remove one of the chapters. And maybe we, maybe it's time to publish that chapter now. Because I argued, having gone all the way through the book, that it didn't matter what Hubbard was like. What mattered was, did Scientology work? Yeah. And I used Freud as an example to say, you know, he's a terribly damaged human being. And maybe there is a problem here. If you're a physicist, doesn't hide. If you're a physicist, then it doesn't matter if if you're a serial killer. Right. You can check the work. The That's problem right. is if you're devising a therapy system, and you are classifiably in Freud's case and in Hubbard's a malignant narcissist yep. with paranoid tendencies and megalomania then you're probably not the person to follow in terms of finding out how to become a whole human being. Exactly. Because the entire goal is off. And maybe let's just spend the last, let's just kind of move, maybe move toward wrapping this up by kind of going yep. here for a second. Because I think you're probably the most intelligent and informed person for me to bring this up with, where we can kind of, talk about this briefly and kind of get right to the point of it without getting into all the faldy raw surrounding it. And that is yeah. what was Hubbard actually trying to do? And this is where we get into maybe some of the occult origins of this, right? Because you have Hubbard's affirmations and you have Hubbard's occult beliefs and you have this hypnotism component and all of these components point in one very, very clear direction. And that is Hubbard dominating other people, not helping them. Hubbard's affirmations confirm this. It's his own writing, his own words. He had a goal, and it was a very clear-cut goal, and it was a very strong goal to dominate and control people, not help them. And so yeah. when you look at the auditing framework and everything we've talked about here, what you know, two and two does kind of equal four here. You know, what, what do you think? Yeah, I, I mean, Fory Ackerman, who is his agent from the 30s and, and right on into the 50s, um, a very fascinating guy, mm -hmm. he shared the correspondence, um, we, we shared with me the correspondence he'd had with Hubbard over the years. And there's a letter, again, Tony Ortega has it up at the underground bunker, um, early 1949 from Savannah, Georgia, um, where... Um, he was staying with Arthur Burks, who, if you want to understand Hubbard, is a very important character because yes. he's the closest to a guru that Hubbard actually had yeah. and seems to have been quite a nice man, if a little bit crazy. And he was a major in the Marines. Um, and Hubbard went and stayed with him. And while staying there, uh, Burks mentions it in his autobiography, Monitors, and talks about Hubbard seeing the little its, which are the... Invisible Spirits, it's the first time we get a mention of it. Yep. And um, yeah, Birch was aware of them, but couldn't see them, whereas Hubbard had them jumping between his fingers and this kind of stuff. But there's a letter, I think January 49, where Hubbard says to Fari Ackerman, his agent, I've got this incredible idea for a book. I can hypnotize women and rape them without them knowing. Yes. Not, I'm gonna clear the world. But I've got these tricks now. Where, and so the 1938 letter, the Skipper letter, where he writes to his first wife, um, the, an actual genuine marriage there, and says his only goal is to smash his name into history. In about 2013, when Marty Rathbun was still blowing his trumpet and hadn't been scared away, um, 
with the threat that he'd lose his adopted child, which is pretty, I'm pretty sure what happened. I imagine yeah. he's on a monthly check. They I offered think, me I this think kind of thing. I think you're exactly I, right. I think that's exactly what's yeah. happening. I was a little rude to them when, when Greg Ryerson offered me, we'll buy paintings from you for the rest of your life. You know, it's like, oh no, you won't. We'll bleep that bit out. Um, but Marty Rathbun wrote this thing in his blog saying that he figured it out, that Hubbard wanted to be worshipped, he wanted to be deified. And I wrote him an email and said, read, let's sell these people a piece of blue sky. And you find that in 1990, I said exactly that. Mm -hmm. I haven't changed a word of it since. But like the Romans and the Chinese, he believed that, that godhood is something that you achieve by your name still being repeated. That's like ancestor right. worship. Yep. And that, that is the purpose of Scientology, the Church of Spiritual Technology, which took half a billion dollars of the 648 million that Hubbard left, exist, came into being to perpetuate the name L. Ron Hubbard. Yep. And so most of the money, and all of that money came from Scientologists, is there so that he will be remembered. I don't mind him being remembered. We can remember Stalin and Mao and Hitler too, and there are lessons to be learned there. And I think Hubbard will become synonymous with, with confidence tricks. Uh, of you know, A friend wrote to me, he's, he's now, he's reading his blue sky at the moment, and, uh, and he wrote to me, he couldn't believe that anybody had perpet perpetrated such an elaborate hoax. And that's how it looks to an outsider who's never been involved. It's an elaborate hoax. And that's all it is. Exactly. Nobody's getting better, you know. Nobody's doing something to help the world as a consequence of Scientology that I'm aware of. We had David Gentile, you, you know, getting a $1.8 billion Russian mafia laundering thing going That's on. Right. But we don't really hear about, you know, the Nobel Prize winning Scientologists. You know, at least Transcendental Meditation had some Nobel Prize winners involved, even though it was a scam. Um, but okay. Scientologists, what have they done that's good for the world? Tom Cruise, John Travolta. I suppose John Travolta's, and they both have made some pretty good movies now, come to think about it. Magnolia is a great movie if you want to know about how to con and trick people. Uh, yeah, exactly. Jerry Maguire, if, if you um, see, Rain Man. If you want to see Tom Cruise's real self come out, watch Magnolia. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he actually yeah. lets slip the, the who he really is in that movie. Well, I, I think he he is that role in, in many places in The Rain yeah. Man. And they are, they are fine performances. I think he has a narrow range, but he's extraordinarily convincing in it. Yep. Uh, Jerry Maguire. Um, but the Rain Man, he has all the work to do because he's the guy with the character arc. Dustin Hoffman is just, you know, an elaborated version of Kim Peek, the autistic savant. Mm -hmm. But Cruz has to, or uh, Color of Money, Paul, mm -hmm. Paul Newman, great film. Mm -hmm. But it's always pretty much the same character. And that character... It, again and again, how was it that Isaac Hayes and Nancy Cartwright could read these lines that shed such light on the human condition without ever realizing that it described the trap they were in? Or Elizabeth Moss, The Handmaid's Tale. Oh, Come on, that's right. wake up. <laughs> that's right, exactly. Well, it really does. And, and at the end of the day, uh, you know, again, um, th actually, this is a really good wrap up point, actually, is because. Um, it, it, at the end of the day, people will, can and will, believe anything <laughs> if they have a good enough reason to. And usually that reason, when it comes to this kind of belief, this kind of idea, is emotion-based. It's based in that euphoria. It's based in those feelings. My feelings can't be lying to me. Well, they're not. The feeling of certainty. Yeah. yeah. Those feelings aren't lying to you. It's the indoctrination that comes along with it is the point we were trying to make. The framing of those feelings is the lie. You know, there's nothing wrong with feeling really good. But how you interpret that feeling and what it means for your future has everything to do with truth versus, you know, fantasy. And... And this is why we have to be careful about our feelings, not not have them and not, you know, freak out about them, but just understand the context in which they occur, you know, and that's kind of my thing on this. And this is why auditing can be so deceptive is because it makes you feel so damn good 
and tells you in every one of those explanations is total horseshit. So, yeah, I mean, so the, the wrap up quotation would be Voltaire. People who believe absurdities will commit atrocities. And, and that is the problem, that when somebody feels certain this must be true, why is it true? Well, because I believe it's true. Right. Um, same story every time for me, year in, year out. 17 years old, two hours talking to an evangelist. He was an English school teacher. He stopped me on the street to tell me about Jesus, and I had a friendly conversation with him for two hours questioning certain ideas. You know, you know what I'm like. I'm difficult. <laughs> and um, I just happened to have reread the Gospels, not as a believer. And, and so I was able to flummox him. And after two hours, he literally backed away from me. I don't know if he was frightened. I'd jump on his back and bash his head in. It was a lovely sunny day. I didn't feel I'd been perfectly polite, but he was frightened for some reason. He looked at me and he said, I don't understand the Bible but I know it's all true. And I meet that in every Scientologist I meet. You offer me the evidence. You offer me the proof. Not that you feel sure. That's not good enough. That's right. You know, like um, the woman who told me that uh, when I said, look, he wasn't a war hero. I've read his war records. He wasn't a war hero. And she said, yes, he was. And I said, well, how do you know? She said, I was there with him. And I should at that point have said, name the vessels you were on with him. Yes. <laughs> Ten years later, she was in the newspapers saying how dreadful Scientology was. So the message got through in the end. That's but, right. As it usually there we does. Go. Well, John, I want to I want to thank you for partnering with me on this collaborating on this. Uh, yeah, on this it's one. been great. Yeah, this is fun. Um, and I hope everybody out there, I mean, you know, like we, as we do, we, you know, we go here and we go there. But literally almost everything we said here is directly related to uh, or connected dots to, you know, this business of why is Scientology auditing not good for you? Mm. And, I, and I don't think we have weak arguments here. I think these are all, you know, very, very much the facts of the matter. And if you mm. don't want to believe it, great, don't believe it, but realize that we are talking facts. And, mm. and the facts are this stuff is bad for you. It's not just... Mm not good for you. It's actively bad for you. And this is why you see me, you know, specifically, you know, get a little riled up or upset around the topic of independent Scientology is because I'm upset that people get out of this authoritarian group and continue to basically self-abuse with yeah. these processes. You know, it upsets me. It makes me like, mm. I wish they wouldn't do that. You know, it's not... It's not a personal thing. It's not some grudge match I have. It's just I'm upset that these people continue to hurt themselves. And and all the reasons we've laid out here are the reasons why I believe that that is true. So so that's what I wanted to say on this. And uh, mm -hmm. and thank you, John, for helping me explain all this. Yeah, St Steve Hassan's made a very good point. You made it when I first met him in 1989. How would you know if you were under mind control? Right. Right. How would you? How could you be aware of that? And that's the stopping point where you have to go. I need to consider evidence. It's one thing I have these feelings of certainty, these feelings of knowing something, but but what's the actual evidence? I've felt high. I felt good. I felt part of a group. I felt I was doing something to save humanity. And it is very difficult to go from you know one day I'm clearing the planet or this sector of the galaxy through to have I got enough money to buy potatoes at the supermarket, but reality strikes. And, and I think the final point I'd like to make is I'm so now than I ever was when I was a Scientologist. I am so much more calm and at ease, so much more able to think. And, and the first year after I left was I was blissed out by this thought that I no longer had to comply to L. Ron Hubbard's thinking. I could think for myself for the first time in 10 years. I could think for myself. And that thinking has led me to, uh, you know, and I was harassed for 16 years and, and went through dreadful things. My health collapsed. I had all sorts of things which were a direct consequence of very serious harassment on a daily basis, you know, being sued. I don't know how many times. Imagine that, getting to the point where you don't know how many 
court case has been brought against you. It was awful. But now I'm a happy bunny. And that's got nothing to do with Scientology or any need of needing fixing or anything like that. And, um, you know, nearly 67 years old. And it's okay. You can let go of this stuff. Jerry Armstrong said to me when I first met him in 84, he said, the tone level of the C organization is fear. That's emotionally what's actually happening there. That's right. And I think he might have been wrong. I think it might be blame, shame, and regret. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> I, well, I wish them all well. It, having lived it for 17 years, I readily agree with that statement. Mm -hmm. But yeah. I'll tell you what, the crazy thing about it is that it's reframed. So you mm -hmm. don't think about it that way. You yeah. don't think that you're in fear, even though your body is having fear responses. And when you start yeah. reframing reality to yourself in such strong terms, it messes with you. It really does take a while mm -hmm. to undo that stuff. So... Yeah, big time. Yeah, I, I, I helped to uh, intervene with, with a 20-year SEAL member many years ago. And she said that, that she'd gone on a leave of absence, something that very rarely happened for her. Uh, she worked directly for David Miscavige and um, slept two hours a night. Two hours a night. Yeah. Five hours was a good night's sleep. Just yeah. how destructive can you be? And she went home to look after her mum because her mum had, had had a hip replacement. And she said she went into the supermarket. And she, this was an environment that was completely foreign to her. And she felt such pity for all of the people walking around who didn't know that they were Thetans. Yeah. Then she went back to the base, got abused a bit more and went, I can't do this anymore. And the reason I was involved was because uh, she wanted to say goodbye to her husband who um, came down with Ken Hoden to Oakland. And I had to sit in a room with Ken Hoden. I, I was a fighter pilot. I was a fighter pilot. And um, I, my dad was a minister. You know, like I know that all religions hate all other religions. And he, he went to leave and the, the mum had made him a cup of coffee. And the husband said to him, oh, matter of courtesy, you've got to drink the coffee. It came straight off the hob and went straight down his throat. He must have burned himself. And I realised, and I was sitting there going, oh, he's a fighter pilot. You know, he might thump me, you know, he's really angry. I, I was not happy about this situation. He was terrified of me. Yep. Terrified. Yep. So he was willing to burn his own throat to get out of the room because of my incredible psychic power. That psychic power is guided imagination. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I have the power of words. That's all I've got. Well, I'll tell you, I'll, uh, I'll let you know. I, I think I've mentioned this to you before, just for the audience as well. Ken Hoden, that man you ran into, uh, was on the RPF with me. Mm -hmm. 2005, six, seven. And he was not a happy camper and he was not no. doing the program. And he languished no. around in there in abject apathy, really. I mean, mm -hmm. a defeated, broken man yeah, for a few years. It was really quite sad, even for the Sea Organ, for that situation, um, to mm -hmm. see him broken that way. Um, yeah. And he's still in the Sea Org today. He's no longer on the RPF, but he's still in there. How very sad. Very. And, and let's just say this last thing, which, which is that, that anybody who is the victim of Scientology deserves help, compassion, That's care. Right. And that our, you know, my concern when I came back in 2013 and I had a couple of years of quite seriously doing this, leading to our fortuitous meeting at Toronto in, in 2015, that, that my concern is for the people who've, who've been harmed and damaged right. and to help them. That's and there right. is so much out there, which is kind of some kind of conflict or war against these people as if it's their fault that they've been abused in this way. So that's right. You know. That's right. Even I will, I will even go out so far as to say that um, even Tom Cruise. Yeah. You know, I, I will go so far as to say even David Miscavige, but having said that, you know, when I heard that Hubbard had, had died, I wept because I felt that he could no longer be redeemed. 
And I'd sort of, in the back of my mind, thought they'll catch him, he'll go to prison. One of the 300 writs that have been issued against him will hit. He'll go to prison and I, maybe I can go and talk to him and help him. Now, I understand a bit more now <laughs> about psychiatric conditions and don't think it would be helpful. But with Miscavige, of course, he should pay for what he's done. Yeah. But, and it, you know, that probably means prison, I think. You know, for, yeah, for him, least. yeah, for him. But I, to, to punish somebody, you know, I understand, I, I don't, along the way, you probably talked with Ron, his dad, Ron. Mm -hmm. I interviewed him at one point, and what a delightful human being. Yeah. You go, how did this happen? What happened to the young David Miscavige was asthma plus Scientology. That's right. And uh, it didn't work well for him, and it's certainly, he's done a tremendous amount of damage to thousands of people since then. That's right. And uh, he ought to be ashamed of himself, frankly. Yeah, big time. Big time. I doubt he ever will be, but... <laughs> Unfortunately, he's a little socked in. But I but I do yeah. hear you. And actually, at the end of the day, and, you know, when I'm really kind of pulled out of the whole thing emotionally, I have to agree with you. You're absolutely right, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, because that is, that is what this group is about. It is about victimizing people, and it is about dominating and controlling them. And that has always been, from day one what it's been about. And that's a hard pill to swallow for people who've spent so long in it, like me, like you, like other people. It's a hard pill. It's not easy. It's not fun. Mm -hmm. It's not like, oh, wow, I feel so much better now. It's it's not that kind of a thing. You know, you're not going to mm -hmm. feel better realizing this, but it is what it is. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, this is one of those things where it's really kind of one of those cases of, 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 it really is better to live with an uncomfortable truth than a pleasing lie, you know, yes. and, and, and the uncomfortable truth about Scientology is it was never about helping people, hmm. you know? Yeah. It, it was always about power, money, adulation for Ron Hubbard. And now of course it's passed from a, a petty sadist, you know, Hubbard was throwing people overboard into sewage in the water. Yeah. Um, he, he, did horrible, awful things, having brought forward a, a therapy that was going to get rid of trauma and charge. He's then abusing people, having people push peanuts around the deck with their noses, getting splinters in their faces. I mean, come on, with the whole crew standing around watching it. This man liked to humiliate people. Miscavige has mm -hmm. taken it a shade darker. That's right. You know? That's right. And, and his redemption will come with restraining him so that he cannot harm people anymore exactly. and possibly uh, taking money out of the living trust in the Netherlands Antilles. Oh, we're not meant to know about that. Oh, shh, 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 shh. See, got to keep the secrets. <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Secrets I know, somewhere. right? I know. Well, okay. Jonathan, thank you. Thank you very much for helping me with all of this and, and, uh, and working thank with you. me on this one. Yeah, this was fun. Um. I will, I will wrap up now by, by saying, folks out there, of course, for both of our channels, uh, if you like these channels, if you like what we're doing, if we're educating, informing, and entertaining you, uh, consider supporting us, right? We both have Patreon accounts. We both have uh, other more immediate uh, routes. Links, PayPal. links mm -hmm. below in the comment section links or in the, in the description section of our videos. We put those links up for you guys so you can show us some love. And... Um, and we appreciate that because uh, this is... Yeah, and if you want us to keep doing it, this is free. As yeah. Jack Conti, the founder, the great Jack Conti, the founder of Patreon said, you know, I'm giving you this stuff for free. You can have it. I'm not going to stop you having it as long as, but we have to eat. Exactly. <laughs> Got it. So these, if these you cans would like don't other fill people themselves. to have it, <laughs> you know, if you'd like others to have the wins that you've had, then put five bucks a month in on Patreon, please. Exactly. You know? Buy us a cup of coffee. All right, yeah, guys. Just one cup of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> and with that, on that happy note, we will wrap up. Um, I will see you guys. We will see you guys next week. Yep. Bye -bye. There's always more.